Okay, great. So let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, welcome, Kat, um, and welcome everybody to our discussion on ethical design and tech anti-patterns with Kat Zoe. Um, just by way of introduction, Kat is a product designer at Spotify and the creator of the Design Ethically Project, which started out as a framework for applying ethics to the, to the design process and has now grown into a toolkit of speculative activities to help teams forecast the consequences of their projects. She's also a master's student at the University of Cambridge studying AI ethics and society. She has presented her work in front of audiences all over the world, including tech conferences, government agencies like the FTC and academic workshops. Before moving to Stockholm where she's currently based to work for Spotify, Kat worked as a designer in the public services division at IBM and in cybersecurity. Today, she serves on the board of advisors at the YX Foundation, which is a hybrid coalition design lab focused on the intersections of AI and machine learning and critical race theory. And you can find her website at www.catherine with a K M Zo Z H O U.com. So, welcome, Kat. Thank you again. Thank you to everyone who's listening in today. Um, and also, thank you to 500 Global for having me here. I'm going to just quickly share my screen and hopefully, y'all can see this. Um, okay, I am so thrilled to be with you uh, virtually calling in from Stockholm, Sweden. My name is Kat Zo, pronouns she, her, and really excited to talk to you about anti patterns uh, when design gets deceptive. So, uh, this is a little bit about myself, which Courtney has already gone through. Here's a photo of my dog. Um, it's a very serious looking photo. We're not nearly as serious as this. Um, and here is the screenshot for Design Ethically. You can check out the URL on the bottom um, and just go through some of the activities if they work for you. So I wanna talk about anti-patterns. Um, and before I kind of kick this off, I'm gonna ask a rhetorical question because this is kind of a one-sided webinar right now, but um, think about the last time you experienced an anti-pattern. And maybe you don't know what those are and we'll dive into that. But if you do know what they are, just think about it. Um, and just think about how it worked, how it made you feel, uh, whether it worked on you um, and actually got something out of you or not. Um, but for this talk, I kind of want to start off with a holistic view, looking at the rise of the anti-pattern, kind of how it came to be, the historical tributaries that fit into it um, before going into more of the nitty gritty actionable stuff. So um, I want to start off with this photo, which uh, is very vivid and colorful and might elicit some kind of uh, sensory uh, reception for you. It's a grocery store. And this photo is here because the grocery store is used as this kind of case study in most marketing classes. Um, if you've ever been in a class where they start off with the example of how in grocery stores, every single inch of this layout is planned. Um, and every single product placement, you know, why this type of cereal is next to that type of cereal is very intentional. And the level of detail and thought and strategy that goes behind this whole experience is pretty wild when you first learn about it. Um, and, you know, just from this photo, I can surmise that this is an American grocery store because it's got some cereals that I do not see in Sweden and that I crave very much. Um, but yeah, there's so much thought that goes behind this whole experience from even before you step in to the grocery store itself, the size of the shopping carts, the smells, the music, everything. Um, and this kind of strategy is not just in grocery stores, it's in all brick and mortar retail shops for the most part, um, especially the ones that have really gotten big. Um, and this kind of theory really became popular um, and it actually went into like academic, uh, the academic canon around the 1940s and 50s um, being known as consumer behavior research. And essentially it legitimized this kind of attitude of understanding users, getting to know them, using a combination of methodologies like behavioral science and economics, psychology, to essentially persuade consumers or users to do things 
to buy things, to spend time in your store or um, a variety of other end goals, right? I wanna share another photo. And this is a photo of an advertisement. And you know, right off the bat, it's just this very loud, incredibly active car dealership ad from Ohio, somewhere in Ohio. Um, I can even hear it just by looking at it. I can hear the person screaming, zero down, zip, zero, zilch. Um, it's just a lot. And it's promising what seems to be a lot. I don't really know much about cars myself. I've never bought one, um, but it seems like there's a lot of good deals being offered on this. And the same end goal exists for this car ad, which is that they're trying to get people to step foot in the dealership and walk out with the car. Funnily enough, this advertisement actually got the car dealership who's responsible for this ad in trouble by the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, specifically for this one itty bitty little blurb right here in the fine print, which I cannot read because <laughs> uh, it's so blurry. So I typed it out here for you. It says subject to 800 beacon score or higher with approved credit. You might be wondering what the heck is a beacon score? So is the FTC. Um, turns out it's a very obscure score that is incredibly hard to obtain. Uh, it's really hard to get 800 in and virtually renders this entire advertisement kind of impossible. Um, it's basically ensuring that no one can qualify for this zero down zip zero zilch deal. Um, and the FTC mentioned that that was incredibly misleading. Um, and maybe they got people into the doors of their dealership, um, but it was problematic in that it tricked folks in some kind of way with the fine print. Um, and that brings me to today with, with tech and with the digital products that we have and the digital storefronts that we have. And here's just a screenshot. It's a bit outdated. I don't think LinkedIn has this anymore, but it was from LinkedIn's um, premium page where they were trying to get you to sign up. Um, and it offered a bunch of really seemingly compelling uh, memberships that you could get, you know, it's a lot of cool, cool catchphrases here, finding leads and building trusted relationships and learning new skills. Um, and they don't include any of the pricing plans on the front page, um, which makes it a bit misleading. And, but still the, the end goal of this is also just to get your foot in the door and hopefully get some dollars in their pocket. Right. And this example here is known as an anti-pattern that falls under the price comparison prevention category, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Um, but these three examples are, I bring them up because in some ways they have the same vein that kind of connects them all, which is that it's just a company in, that is trying to employ some kind of methodology that gets you to spend your money or spend your time or whatnot. Um, on their product. And this methodology often ties in with psychological principles, with behavioral science, um, and it involves some kind of manipulation. And they're different, of course. You know, the, it's very nuanced because some of these things are legal and some of these things are not legal, which um, as to why they are that way is not something that I have a concrete like opinion on. Um, but fundamentally, they all play into that manipulation. So I want to bring us to 2010. Um, so the power of naming. This 2010 was the year that Harry Brignall named these kinds of practices in tech, uh, calling them dark patterns. And he and Alexander Darlington built darkpatterns.org. And on the right side of the screen, you see a screenshot from that website, which lists all the different types of dark patterns that they had observed at the time. There's probably some more that aren't encapsulated on the website. Um, and it's really fascinating, especially if you read through this. Um, it might be a bit hard to see on this screen, but if you go on the website, you can take a look at these and there's examples that you can click on. Um, and as you're reading through these, you might notice that you get a little angry. <laughs> you might notice that you don't feel that great. Um, and generally, people don't feel that great when they realize they've been duped. Um, and it's even worse when you don't realize you've been duped and you realize it months later when you get a bill from some random app that you barely recall trying out. So the power of naming basically helps 
all of us in that we started to pinpoint these examples and people started saying, hey, this isn't great. This isn't great. And this actually built up um, more momentum around this. And then over a decade later, now the FTC is looking into this kind of stuff. My personal favorite here is privacy zuckering, which is when you're tricked into sharing more information about yourself than you intended on doing so, named after the one and only Zuckerberg. Um, but a quick note here, which is that you might have noticed that my presentation was called Anti-Patterns. Um, during the FTC event in early spring this year, uh, where they brought in a lot of different experts from academia and industry, um, the point was brought up that we might wanna reconsider what we call these things um, instead of dark patterns, um, just because of the, the historical precedent in Western society to kind of associate um, good and bad with this light dark binary, um, especially when situated in a uh, society when we have colorism, for example, it might not be the most apt name. Also dark is kind of ambiguous. Um, and also with anti-patterns, it's not the perfect name either, actually. Um, there's also an existing terminology, uh, anti-patterns in computer science that it might be confused with. So at the moment, I think they're, the industry is still trying to find a proper name for this. Um, if you want a real mouthful, uh, you can go with manipulative user experience design uh, or deceptive user experience design. But essentially what this concept boils down to, um, if you want a definition, is that it is a user interface that has been crafted to trick users into performing actions they might not have intended to perform. And one thing that I really wanna highlight here is the crafted part. Um, it is very rare to have an anti-pattern that is a mistake. Generally speaking, anti-patterns involve a lot of thought behind them and there's some deliberation behind them. It takes a lot of thought to think about how you can make a user do something that they may, might not wanna do. Um, and it's that's the point that I wanna kind of really highlight there. Um, and the end goals for anti-patterns or for the people that employ anti-patterns, if I wanna phrase that a little bit more clearer, um, it is to get users to not only share more data, um, also engage more time on whatever product it is, and also spend more money. And one could argue that their data and their time are variations or forms of money for our users. So uh, I want to jump into some quick examples of anti-patterns. I'm not going to go through all of the ones that were listed um, in that previous slide, but I uh, just want to share a couple and uh, give you a heads up, it might make you really angry um, just looking at them. You might have experienced something very similar to these yourself. Um, they're not fun. And so this one right here is from GoDaddy from a while back. And uh, this is categorized into the sneak into basket uh, anti-pattern, which is when they try to essentially sneak in a particular um, item when you're shopping and make it very subtle so you don't really realize that you're gonna be paying extra for this. Um, and as you can see, the default option here is not no thanks, it is this privacy protection, which if you're just breezing through this wizard flow, you might completely miss and just end up paying $10 for privacy, whatever that means. Um, another one, this is privacy zuckering, and you can see um, it's not quite clear in the, the buttons, at least the treatment uh, lends itself to the user clicking on OK, which is uh, basically letting them use cookies. Um, and for that, like, you don't necessarily need to have cookies for forever21.com. <laughs> uh, it's not in your best interest necessarily. Um, so there's a bit of manipulation there. Um, there's also confirm shaming, which this one is the most annoying one, I think. Um, not the most nefarious one, but definitely the most petty one. Like imagine being the person writing like all these petty messages of, oh, I don't want to be a healthy, good person. Like, okay, relax. Um, then there's also the trick question one. Uh, and this one happens quite a bit of, again, it's that button treatment that they've incorporated, designing this primary default button to be the one that you don't necessarily want to click. Um, and this one is uh, an example of a hidden cost one. Airbnb's gotten a lot of um, flack for this 
kind of feature where they tell you it's $55 per night and suddenly you're paying all these extra fees that you didn't realize you had to pay for and it becomes almost double or actually double that. Um, so it's just really annoying. It's disingenuous, it's misleading, uh, it's frustrating. Um, and then another example is the trick question kind where you get um, on the bottom of this form, these two uh, check boxes that kind of make it confusing as to whether you should be getting details or not, depending on what you check off. Oops. Um, and this one, especially, this was actually one that I experienced like just the other day um, as I was booking a flight via Ryanair. Um, don't ask me why I was booking off of Ryanair. Um, but this checkbox right here, basically, I can't really decipher if I'm going to be getting offers or not, um, because it says if you don't wish to receive these offers, opt out. But then it also prefaces that with a, a statement saying that our subscribers get the best offers. It's incredibly confusing. Um, and last but not least, this is the Roach Motel one. Um, it's a, an iteration of the Roach Motel, which is essentially an experience that makes it very hard for you to get out of um, that said experience and think of like subscriptions that are very hard to cancel. And in this case, this is, I, I believe it's Tumblr that um, makes it incredibly hard for you apparently to get out of receiving ads from all of these companies um, or having your data being sent to these companies for advertising purposes, I believe. And instead of giving you one like opt out of all of these uh, toggle, you have to go and toggle every single one of these uh, companies individually, um, which takes a lot of time and is very frustrating. So um, why are anti-patterns unjust? And there's a couple things. So first of all, they are an infringement on a lot of our rights. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about some of the policies that have already been crafted for our privacy rights, um, just for our digital rights um, that have been happening in a variety of states and locations. Um, they're not great. And they tend to try to uh, take our data, our time, our money, which is not fair. Um, and also, so, with these anti-patterns, at best, they're a nuisance to most, but at worst, they can really hurt marginalized uh, folks in our communities. And I wanna kind of emphasize that a bit. So um, in previous conversations with folks, we've been kind of talking about how it is, uh, to kind of understand anti-patterns and what they are, it takes, a, it takes some level of digital literacy, right? Especially for a lot of the more subtle ones. Like when you think of the Google search results page and how they have a lot of ads that are actually tucked in the results that might be kind of subtle and have very subtle treatment, uh, design treatment. So you can't really distinguish them from the other search results that easily. Um, to a trained eye, to someone who maybe is very familiar with this kind of design uh, pattern, you can probably pick it up. But to an untrained eye, you might not notice that. Um, and this kind of digital literacy comes with exposure. It comes with having actual programs that teach you this kind of stuff. Um, and so for those of us who are not lucky enough to kind of be exposed to that and realize that, uh, they're vulnerable to these kinds of anti-patterns and other malicious types of design, uh, which is unfair and not good. So I want to talk just say yeah. one thing. I loved that you started with that grocery store image, because mm -hmm. for those of us that have lived in the United States for substantial periods of time, that feels really normal. And as you were going through each of these examples, I'm realizing these are such a part of our daily life. They become so normalized. This treatment online has become normal feeling, but just kind of seeing you call it out is making me more mad about yeah. <laughs> what I encounter on a daily basis, which is really yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. It is so normalized now. And this is something that we talk about again and again of when these practices become normalized, when they get taught in universities and in boot camps and stuff, um, it becomes very hard to kind of legislate around it uh, just because it's so prolific and everywhere. Um, and it's one of the bigger barriers, I think, is to kind of 
redo and redesign the narrative around these experiences and saying, hey, maybe that's not okay. Um, but yeah, thank you for that point. Uh, and with that, actually, I kind of want to talk about just the, the underlying um, incentives of, you know, this whole idea of getting our users hooked and getting people to, to do things in, um, in ways that maybe they don't want to do. Uh, so it's so prevalent, right? And it's, it's happening everywhere. Um, and there's a lot of drivers behind that, but there's one big driver that I think really ties together a lot of the entities in this overall system. Um, and so when you think about like what drives like a product team, right, to do things like this, or what drives maybe a design organization that encompasses that product team to do things like that, or the overarching company, right? Or perhaps the locale, like what drives, you know, the Silicon Valley um, attitude and, and what motivates companies within that area to do things um, and to employ these practices. Uh, what drives the overarching tech industry? And then finally, what drives this uh, large racial capitalist system in which we all exist? And this is a phrase that I'm borrowing from Cedric Robinson, who's an American uh, political scientist who wrote a lot uh, and extensively about the intersections between capitalist systems of extraction and exploitation and our constructs of race that we have in society. Um, and the theme that kind of ties all of these together and acts as that primary driver is something that you can find in all of these different headlines, right? And it's that word growth. Um, and this word is such a sexy word in our industry. You hear it in job titles, growth designer, growth engineer. You hear it um, as the growth hacker or you're on a growth team. Um, it's everywhere, right? And what I want you to do is kind of take a pause and think about growth at what cost, right? What is uh, happening when we pursue growth this relentlessly? Who's benefiting and who's not? Um, and the fact of the matter is that in order to survive in today's tech industry, companies have to ruthlessly design for growth. So the pursuit of growth is so baked into tech and our, and our overall system that we not only regularly lobby against regulation, but we also have devised and normalized these practices to pursue growth. Um, and I that point is tying back to what Courtney was saying. It's so normalized. And it and I'm going to show you this one um, product cycle, which is like basically the product cycle zoomed out at like a 10,000 foot view. So you probably use something like this if you're in a product team or a company or startup. Um, and it might not be called this or it might have a lot more detail that's filled in. Uh, this is very zoomed out. Um, but normally most companies operate in the same kind of way where every quarter you've got objectives and key results that are chosen, OKRs, you might call them something else, but these essentially are measurable goals. Um, and I'll talk more about them in the next slide. And so you choose these goals out and it could be something like, oh, I wanna increase premium uh, subscriptions by this much percentage. And then throughout the quarter, the folks on the product teams which includes designers and engineers and maybe some business folks as well, a bunch of folks, they tweak the product in order to achieve said OKRs, right? Rinse and repeat, it happens all the time. Um, and it, it's not a big deal, right? It's so normal. And, and as I was saying, the anatomy of an OKR, it's quantitatively measurable and often is related to the bottom line. You might have some OKRs or some teams that are focusing on maybe moonshot products that don't necessarily bring much money to the company. But generally speaking, most teams are working on something that's profitable or will be profitable. And they generally measure success based on something that is related to that. Maybe it's engagement, maybe it's actual just memberships or whatnot. Um, and so from an employee perspective, often employee performance is tied to how they were able to impact OKR achievement. Um, and you might be thinking, well, maybe. Uh, and generally speaking, when you think about it, right, when you're going through your performance review at work, you're gonna, at, you're gonna be asked, oh, what impact have you had? Um, and they're not really gonna care. At least your boss probably is not gonna care if you said, oh, I've 
volunteered at the soup kitchen like 20 times this month. Um, they'll be like, that's nice, but what have you done to help the company? Because that's what apparently matters for your promotion. Um, and so employees have an incentive to fulfill these OKRs directly or indirectly. And this is just how it is. And saying this, it again, probably sounds so normal. You're like, obviously, of course, this is just how companies work. Um, but what does that lead to? What kind of actions do those incentives lead to, right? On one hand, you might have them leading to the, the development of these kinds of processes like gamification or nudging or even A-B testing, right? Which I would argue are all ways in which we subtly manipulate the users um, or persuade them to do things. And with A-B testing, we're trying to see which one works, which uh, design maybe works better so that they will do something that we want them to do. And so these are all subtle tactics that we have um, built out to kind of get users to do what we want to do and get the end result that we want to get. Um, and this is, these are so, you know, accepted and they're taught everywhere. Um, they're employed at every company, totally normal. Um, and then when you take it even further, you get into the realm of dark or anti-patterns. Um, and that is when it becomes more extreme. And I just want to share this one quote by one of my favorite authors, uh, Bell Hooks, who says that being oppressed means the absence of choices. And I, I want you to think about that as you think about, you know, your product and, and anti-patterns within a product. Um, now, I'm not advocating that we give users every single choice in the world, right? Like when I'm signing on to like Twitter on my phone, I don't need to choose the color of the logo. It might be fun for a day, but I don't really care about that that much. Um, but I do care about, you know, where my data is going, who can see my data, like what kind of ads I'm getting shown, all that stuff. I do care about that. Um, and I do care about my autonomy as a user. And I think that's something that we have to remember is that anti-patterns act against user choice, right? It's all about undermining their ability to choose by trying to nudge them in a very coercive way to do something that they might not want to do. Uh, which is incredibly problematic. Um, so why we have to give a damn about this? Um, I'm guessing that everyone who's attending this talk already does give some kind of damn about this because you're attending this in the middle of the day. Um, but yeah, I just want to just touch on this a little bit briefly. So, you know, in my, in my work with design ethically um, and with like anti-patterns and whatnot, I've gotten to just go all around the world talking to people in policy and academia and in product teams. It's been super fascinating. And one underlying thing kind of ties people together. It's, it's a sentiment that really resonates with me, which is that often people say that they feel like they're just one we person in the great abyss who happens to be attending this event. Um, and I don't know about you, but this one really hits home for me and not to get super existential <laughs> in the middle of the day. Um, but yeah, it can feel like that often. And it can often feel like, you know, our circle of um, impact maybe only extends to those directly around us, like our, our close friends and family, our colleagues that we work with day to day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, especially if you are working in tech, right, and you've got likely hundreds and thousands of users, if not more, your impact is a lot larger. And that means that you have a lot of privilege in some sense. Um, and I want to kind of underscore the privilege part because it really is a privilege to be working in tech, right? It's a privilege to be working from home safely during a pandemic for the most part. It's a privilege to be making a tech salary. It's a privilege to be building experiences that shape other people's realities in some sense, right? Especially if you're building products that maybe affect how they view their world and how they get knowledge about the surrounding world. That's a lot of privilege. And when you multiply that with the amount of technological diffusion there is just by virtue of all these different devices and platforms and all these different, you know, locales in which you're shipping your products, that leads to amplified power. So my question to you to think about is what are you going to be doing with that amplified power? Who are you going to be helping um, and who will you be empowering with that? So if that doesn't inspire you to give a damn about this stuff, maybe this will, which is just here's a slew of screenshots of um, 
basically policies that are kind of coming into play or have already come into play around anti-patterns. And so what's clear is that anti-patterns are now on the minds of folks in Capitol Hill, right? People at the FTC are looking into this really seriously right now. Um, people in academia are looking into this. Uh, there are dark pattern tip lines that are popping up. Uh, there are bills that are uh, either getting drafted like the Detour Act and the SAFE Act that haven't gotten as far as maybe we would have liked, but it, they have set a really powerful precedent, right? And it's a bipartisan pre precedent that they've set because these are bills that are being worked across the aisle. Um, there are policies in California that have been uh, created that are basically changing the game when it comes to how legislation is approaching these kinds of manipulative design patterns that tech companies are using. So people are starting to care about this um, in the policy world. And I think that means that it is more imperative than ever for us, those are uh, that are uh, working in tech, to start caring about this ourselves and ensuring that we're not violating anything um, that could be potentially law down the line. So here's just a, a screenshot of the dark patterns tip line. It came out recently this year. Definitely check it out if you yourself uh, experience any kind of dark patterns. Uh, you can report it and you can uh, let the community know. So uh, when it comes to implementing respectful UX in your own product, let's uh, dive into this a little bit more. So I, I want to kind of approach it from a today and tomorrow perspective. So um, today being like right now, this is what you can do, and tomorrow being down the line, more future facing, more speculative. So say you're in a product team or you've got your own startup, what you can do is you can conduct intermittent audits of your products, right? If you have any anti-patterns that are employed, you probably know by now, uh, especially if it's like on a particular part of the product that you're working on. Um, I understand that in some other tech companies, like, you know, especially larger ones, it's so siloed from division to division. You might not know of an anti-pattern that's being employed that's built by someone three divisions over. Uh, but in, within your kind of frame of reference, you would know likely if there was an anti-pattern that was being incorporated by your team. Um, but with that said, conducting these audits to make sure that you don't have anything um, that's not great uh, is really important. Also, establishing company policy that prohibits anti-patterns um, and educating your, your employees. Um, this is for the folks in, uh, in the audience that have their own startups and companies. Um, and if you're not a founder or CEO or whatnot, what you can do is maybe bring it up to your company, uh, propose it somewhere, get, get a Slack conversation started about this um, if you're gutsy enough and talk about how these things should not be allowed within your company. Also, listen to your users. This is so fundamental. I can pretty much guarantee you that every single anti-pattern that we've seen today or is out there has probably um, been uh, on the receiving end of a really pissed off or angry you know, customer review, or maybe someone DM'd Twitter, the Twitter account for the company saying, what the heck was that? Um, people do respond to these things and they will tell you if it's bothering them. I am an avid fan of DMing companies that I'm mad at that have screwed up my order to <laughs> tell them that I don't want to pay for this. Um, so listen to them and they will be the first ones to tell you if you've got an anti-pattern that's problematic. Um, so for tomorrow, for a more future- Can I just phase, pause you real quick? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you on your today one. Um, if you don't mind going back. Um, yeah. So these are all really, really helpful suggestions. Um, there's also a question in the feed about, as a designer, if you have tips about how to influence your business or what you've learned as a designer at Spotify in a big company. Um, you know, when, when you're talking about something that's rooted in how a lot of us are starting to think about good business, um, and shareholder capitalism. But when, you know, as of today, as you pointed out, growth is still sort of dominating the conversation, even though that's shifting a bit. And my suspicion is 
um, in the next 12 months, if you're a tech company and you have not had a discussion about dark patterns and anti-patterns and everything you're talking about here, that that's problematic, um, that that's something that needs to be happening now. But you know, what advice do you have from your own experience about influencing internally, any kind of practical tips? Um, and if you are conducting an audit like this, um, and you're not sure how, like where on the spectrum a particular anti-pattern falls, how problematic it is, if it needs to be addressed, et cetera, are there sort of like communities or resources that you recommend looking to, to start that discussion and get a second opinion? Mm, great questions. Uh, for the first part about, you know, influencing change within your company as a designer, or maybe as an engineer or anyone who's kind of boots on the ground building these products. Um, I think there are so many different avenues you can go. And I think some of the most important ones you can do are speaking up within your company. Um, and this is something I want to preface. It takes some guts. Um, it's not easy to kind of drop it in a company-wide slack of, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this or speaking up at a town hall. Um, but what you can possibly do to start off is just talking with your, is by talking with your colleagues, maybe directly around you, um, being like, hey, I don't think this is right. Um, and then having that kind of conversation going, gaining that solidarity, um, because you're likely not the only one who probably thinks that it's problematic um, if there's a very glaring anti-pattern in your product. Um, when it comes to kind of resources around, you know, figuring out these the severity of these anti-patterns that you might have in your company um, or in the product. Uh, I recommend checking out like that darkpatterns.org site or the dark patterns tip line. Um, they include some examples. Um, and generally speaking, I think with anti-patterns, you can tell, you can even talk to your users. If you're if you've got a user researcher in your team, you can have them kind of test that part of the website with a focus group or with users um, in like a, a user testing session and see if your users bring it up as like, hey, I wasn't a fan of this part of the experience. I didn't like this confusing questionnaire at the bottom. I couldn't tell what you wanted from me. Um, and so incorporating that. Um, and again, I wanna kind of under, underscore the idea that you generally will know if it's an anti-pattern when you're you know, building it and designing it out because you, you probably will feel yourself like, hey, this is a bit convoluted. Um, and so go with your gut as well. But yeah, great questions. Thank you. Um, and then for the tomorrow aspect, and as I was saying, this is a bit more, you know, down the line, speculative, um, that kind of tomorrow. Uh, one thing you can do is to keep on top of evolving anti-patterns. Um, there's going to be new ones. I mean, as long as we continue to have more regulation around this, companies are going to still be motivated by growth and they're still going to create new ways of manipulating users. That's just what happens um, unless we fundamentally change our industry. Um, also, one thing we can do is try to reimagine designing consent in tech products. Um, and there's a Stanford Privacy Fellow, Jen King, who mentioned this at the FTC event and it really stuck with me. What does consent mean? Um, and what is a good way of giving consent within our tech products, right? And so typically I think my go-to example of, you know, asking for consent within our products is the terms and conditions form that you have to sign when you make an account with virtually any kind of online digital experience, right? Who actually reads that? They know that you don't read it. I don't read it. And like people who are writing this stuff, who are putting all that legalese in there, they know you don't read it. Um, is that even a valid kind of consent experience? Is that valid? Is that an anti-pattern? Like that is the most popular way of getting users permissions to do things, but it is designed in such an explicitly like blatant and egregious manner that that can't be a legally consent, protective right? thing right you know, right it feels yeah. like it's designed with legal protection in mind like you're protecting yourself from how you're treating someone instead of being designed in a way that's giving people the information they need at the time that they need it mm -hmm. and to the point that you've been making and I love that your your lens here is shifting the seat putting people in the seat of empowerment if we're working in tech and I've, I've been a product manager myself 
we're in a seat of empowerment. To your point earlier, I loved that map with the nodes of our outreach. It's very extensive and easy to underestimate when you feel like you're a cog and the yeah. machine of a bigger company, but you actually have a lot of influence with these small decisions. And I think that shifting that lens, those small shifts, like what you're saying, um, and thinking about giving that information at the time it's needed in a really helpful way is a completely different experience. And it wouldn't yeah. look like terms and conditions to your point. No, exactly. And like, like I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation with that example of the car dealership um, ad, what got them in trouble was that fine print situation and the, the bold advertisement they had on top. Um, essentially, in some ways, the TNC that we have to sign for every app that we use is that fine print, right? Um, you've got like Facebook blaring, oh, we're this is community and like engagement and friends and family. And then in the TNC, you've got all these other things that you're <laughs> getting yourself into. Um, so that's a really crucial point. And I don't know what it's going to look like in the future, right? But it's something that we have to actively work on and imagining. Um, also exploring new indicators of success that are not just growth oriented, right? Um, and this is kind of hard because we're so situated in this like capitalist um, mindset, but what can we measure that's not just tied to the bottom line? Um, what can we focus on that's not just tied to optimizing for the next quarter, right? These short-term growth benchmarks. Um, how can we envision new ways of, of working and new goals to strive for? So looking forward, if I had to kind of forecast um, for the anti-pattern scene, um, I, I feel like if I had a you know, gun to my head had to guess, I think there will be legislation on anti-patterns that will continue cropping up. And I think some of them will eventually get passed. Um, we still are quite a far ways out from like any federal level. I know we've gotten like detour and the Safe Data Act, but those didn't make it very far. Um, but what was encouraging, which is what I mentioned before, was that there was this kind of bipartisan effort um, to tackle this issue. I also, as I also mentioned before, I think that anti-patterns will continue to evolve. Um, that's just to be expected. Um, maybe they'll make appearances in emerging tech like VR, AR. Um, and I think we just have to be very cognizant and be wary of them as they crop up. And I wanna share one photo here. Um, this is the photo that gives me chills all the time. And it also gives me hope in some ways. Um, you might recognize this. It, this was taken in November 2018, I believe, uh, in San Francisco, and it was during the Google walkouts back then when uh, some very senior Google uh, employees were accused of sexual harassment and then basically got off scotch-free. Um, some had very se generous severance packages, which is absolutely absurd. Um, but anyway, this happened. People were rightfully furious, and they walked out. And people took to the streets, they talked about it, they, they had some really important discussions. Um, and what I think this shows is that we do have unprecedented power today. Um, I don't know the full extent to which what Google did after this, but they did make changes eventually. Um, this, it also pushed the needle on a lot of these conversations within other spheres within tech and beyond. Um, and I just wanna highlight that the power that we have of collective action within the tech industry, the power that we have from organizing and you know, spreading more awareness about things, this is something that's so exciting, right? Um, and we're seeing more of this action uh, and unionizing today, more so than ever within this industry. Um, and it's of course has a lot of historical precedents from other industries as well. Um, and I hope that we can continue on with this trend. Um, and I wanna close off, uh, this is my second to last slide, but with this quote from Grace Lee Boggs, who is an American activist, she says that in order to transform the world, we have to transform ourselves. Um, and this quote is really near and dear to my heart. I think it, this involves a lot of self-learning and unlearning on our own part to kind of realize how we can look out for all of our users, but also people that aren't our users um, and people that aren't necessarily like, just everyone. Um, and 
last but not least, nobody's neutral and doing nothing is not neutral. Um, it is important that you speak up on this when you get the chance um, and doing nothing is just complicit in the whole problem. Um, but with that, I just wanna thank you all for joining in um, and thank you so much, Courtney and the 500 Global team for having me here. Thank you so much, Kat. This was a wonderful presentation. We loved speaking with you. You're inspirational. Um, we are excited to continue to watch you building this field of ethical design that's so badly needed and look forward to seeing what you continue to do and do next. So thanks for being here today. Thank you everyone for joining thanks, and everybody. have a nice day wherever you are or evening.